Hello everyone, welcome back to Solar System Tourism in Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1 with Realism Overhaul, where I send my Twitch livestream audience to their preferred destination, providing that they pay with the in-stream currency struts, which they earn by watching. And of course, when we do send them out, we have to keep them resupplied, and that is what this launch is about, sending some supplies over to Mars quickly. And I decided that Vulcan would not be quick enough, apparently, because I worked on a nuclear upper stage for the transfer. And that is what I'm configuring here with some MH and Mon3 thrusters. Oh, sorry, UDMH and NTO, and that's probably because of the propellant that I'm using on the payload. Just to keep it matched up and make it all sort of Soviet-like. In fact, with the ultimate Soviet rocket, as you can see, uh, Soyuz-ish rocket with four RD-270s on each of the boosters and the core. And these RD-270s are using pentaborane, uh, so they're the serious type of RD-270s, if you will. Pentaborane and NTO. Extra ISP with that, 365 seconds of ISP. So that's 20 of those RD-270 engines launching this. Probably excessive, in fact, definitely excessive. Even for the payload that we have going to Mars, this is excessive. And obviously laggy. A nice plume along the way, though. That's a pretty good plume right there. Well, to a large extent, this series is about testing new parts and discovering what new things I need to develop in order to make things work as I intend. Uh, occasionally, I just want to use pure muscle power in order to get things to where they need to go, and this is one of those latter cases where we're just uh, expediting, if you will. But sometimes, including more recent uh, streams of solar system tourism, I have instead uh, taken my time with a particular system. But anyway, here we go. Uh, you can see it had to pitch down so much because it was way overpowered and has a lot of Delta V left over. So the launch was this sort of overshot where it needed to be. Anyway, we separate fairings and that's what it looks like as the transfer begins with this nuclear engine. This is a uh, standard Nerva type-ish, uh, though uh, the power to mass ratio is somewhere in between Nerva and Timberwind. It's not a timber, full Timberwind and it's not a full Nerva, it's somewhere in between the two. Anyway, and there is our encounter with Mars that came up really quickly. It really shows the precision of these things. And once that is on its way, we have to take care of other missions. This is a Uranus resupply that's doing a mid-course correction with its ion engines. That's ultimately 30 X3 ion thrusters powered by a nuclear reactor, a fairly small one. Much smaller than one that would be put on for nuclear thermal propulsion. So here is our Uranus periapsis shaping up, uh, being adjusted by time warping with the ion engines. And because we can time warp during the ion engine burns, they're pretty handy for the outer planets, even though they were a little bit troublesome for Mercury and its quicker orbit. But even so, for my esteemed viewer, K. Pollux, who wanted to go to Pluto, we finally have a Pluto mission. Well, actually, Pollux wanted to go straight out of the solar system, but I decided that Pluto flyby would at least establish the price a little bit better. I decided to use something a little bit more, no more novel. So this is the nuclear light bulb. This is the closed cycle gas core nuclear engine from KSB Interstellar. Very efficient, though very difficult to make, though theoretically possible, very, very difficult to make. And I decide that it would be the best engine to send Pollux out to Pluto with on an escape trajectory out of the solar system as well. Uh, we decide to give some decent amount of habitat space for a very, very, very long trip after all. And of course, lots and lots of supplies, because at the very least, Pollock should not perish prior to reaching Pluto. So we have this sort of setup, and of course, we want tanks along the way there, because we need a lot of Delta V. I wanted to preserve the option of capturing around Pluto if that, uh, if I, in the end, decide that that would be the best thing to do. So, after all, once the tourist has decided on trip, they are a captive audience. So, so anyway, we'll see what happens to Pollux later on. We need huge radiators to make sure that the cooling happens, and you'll see that those are big and they are necessary. 
I decided to be a little bit clever about how I mount this on the launcher because the stage of the launcher is going to be fairly wide. And I didn't really want a really, really tall fairing on top of that because that's more dry mass anyway. So I decided to take off the tanks and separate them off because they were about balanced with the rest of the ship. And we would just sort of do a docking maneuver to put it all together after we did the first power of our transfer burn. I decided not to use a very tall nuclear engines and instead use five smaller ones uh, for the same reason to avoid a really big inner stage and put this all on the Daenerys Aerospike SSTO. So that's what we've got there. But it's not yet the launch window. We have to take care of one other thing, which is this Mars return vessel that will hopefully bring some tourists back from Mars so we don't have to keep resupplying them. So this is an ion engine burn that would, of course, in real life take many, many days but I was able to do thanks to Time Warp much more quickly. And we've got a capture there and it's got plenty of Delta V. So it's all good. And here we are with the launch of Cape Pollux on this Pluto expedition. There's no lander or anything like that. It's just uh, currently a flyby. And there's the buildup of thrust with the Daenerys rocket capable of launching 880 tons to low Earth orbit, by the way, and potentially returning, though our successes with that have been not successful. So, anyway, but uh, up it goes. The plumes could do with a little more work, but it's complicated because it's 36 distinct nozzles on the aerospike, and so it's weird. It doesn't produce a very normal plume at all. In developing this, I wanted a rocket that didn't look like a normal rocket, but had a purpose behind its shape. And of course, the purpose behind this is that it be recoverable, so it's shaped like a pod, uh, a dragon capsule, in fact. So it makes sense, even though it is not shaped like a conventional rocket. So I like it. A lot of people like it. I think it is a good idea, but it would be challenging to make for sure. Anyway, so here we are with the Daenerys in the background and the stage getting ready for the transfer burn. You can see very, very hefty transfer burn. And because we're doing it in two bits, uh, the correction is going to be quite serious as well. It's not showing all of our Delta V right now because the fuel tanks are separated from the ship, right? We have to dock it all together. So not very accurate. There you see after the burn with the nuclear stage, well, they're both nuclear stages, but with this uh, low lower ISP nuclear stage than the closed cycle gas core engine, uh, we have about 6,000 meters per second left to do in the burn. However, once we get all together here, it is gonna take a little bit more than that, more like 7,000 meters per second. But anyway, here we are docking. Of course, there's RCS ports on everything because of this docking maneuver. Otherwise, we wouldn't need RCS ports all over the place, though it's helpful. This thing doesn't turn very quickly as it is. So here we are backing off the engine section to give space to the fuel segment, if you will. In principle, the idea is that this whole thing could spin up and generate some artificial gravity, but we do not do that. Of course, there's no way to check whether there is actual artificial gravity. It's not that big a ship. So it wouldn't be able to generate that much. Not as much as might be necessary, really. But it is a long ship. And here we are docking the large fuel segment. Uh, the engine runs on liquid methane, as you can see. So we're carrying mostly liquid methane in here. Once we get out past the asteroid belt, it's probably going to be cold enough that there's not going to be much boil off anyways. But uh, of course, we've got the MLI layers and everything, though I probably should have made the tanks gold foil or something. More recently, I made a special part that was this sort of tank ring so that I don't have to put so many parts together. I'm sure other mods have had similar sort of tank rings for these kinds of long range ships. And here we are with the burn. You can see it is costing quite a bit more than it originally was supposed to be. More than I thought, actually. 7,800-ish. But we do have that kind of Delta V. Whether we have enough to capture after this burn is a good question, though. I think we were trying to get there relatively quickly so that 
we would actually see it happen, that might be helpful. Uh, otherwise, some transfers to Pluto can take like 40 years, but also to cut down the supplies that might be necessary. So you can see the Pluto periapsis forming there, and we've got a bonus encounter with Sharon slash Karen. Uh, yep, I always pronounce that wrong anyway. And our radiators need to cool off as we go out from Earth SOI. So next up, we have Pekka's starship, which Pekka insisted on calling my lab. And it needs to do a correction burn midway to Mars. And so this is that correction to ensure that it's on the correct approach to Mars. And of course, it's very important because it's carrying a lot of our supplies. And we've gotten some warnings about things around Mars needing supplies, especially the Phobos station, Phobos portal that uh, needs water imminently, like in a hundred days. So some of our supplies really need to get over there and rendezvous. Their, their Phobian porthole needs water. It just had that warning there from TAC Life Support. This is another Mars mission with a lander and a lot of Kerbals. And this is doing its correction burn as well. In more recent streams, I decided it would be more convenient to get everything around Mars into Phobos orbit, so we're going to have a big get-together around Phobos eventually. But right now, it's all in disparate orbits. You can see it's quite a mess around Mars here, and that makes things difficult, of course. This is what our Phobian portal looks like right now, and there are supplies around Mars that it could use. It's just that everything is all over the place. Once we get everything together, it'll be much more convenient, but we also have to worry about there being a potential glitch because Phobos is really small and it's prone to sort of glitchiness, at least historically. So yeah, we do have to watch out for that as we put all of our eggs in one Phobos basket, if you will. But you can see me checking out the supply situation there and noticing a certain Mars vessel with a lot of supplies that could be brought over here in case our other missions don't get there in time. But we have planned the trajectories into Mars so that they would get there in time, and this is one of those missions. The problem with this supply mission that we launched earlier is that it has enough to capture around Mars, but we might need a tug to bring it in because it won't have enough Delta V to get to Phobos on its own. And since it's so heavy, that's a big, big problem. It's got lots of supplies, but uh, we will need a pretty substantial tug to make sure that it can get to Phobos properly. You can see the capture burn for Mars is going to take a big chunk of its remaining Delta V. So anyway, those are the struggles that we have. We've got a Pluto mission along the way. And with that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.